Hello folks, I'm Alan for today's news. I will be bringing you world news, interesting news, news to keep you entertained, and news to keep you informed. I got quite a bit of stuff on here. I, I had a hard time trying to find some stuff to, uh, to put on here. Anyway, I found some knickknacks and stuff, some gardening tips, and FBI, something about FBI, Kraft, uh, Russia. So, let's get on with this. First thing I got is from a KMOV4 out of St. Louis. It says, I thought this was interesting. It says, book overdue by nearly 100 years returned to library. T. Helena, California, KPX. The expression better late than never applies to a story out of Northern California, where an overdue library book is finally back in its rightful place after nearly 100 years. A copy of A History of the United States by Benson Lossing was checked out in 1927 from the St. Helena Public Library, the same year Calvin Coolidge was in the White House and Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. Falling apart and passed due to the library by 96 years, the book was finally returned last week. Almost 100 years since it was, we assume, in the building. So, we just would love to know where it's been, said Chris Crichton, the library's director. Crichton said she was quite surprised when she was told about the book's return. One of my staff members, came up and said somebody had returned that book, and they thought it was really cool. It was a really old book, and we didn't realize quite how old it was. It's falling apart, she said. The book is actually older than the library as it is known today. Published in 1892, it was one of the first books available back when the library was a subscription service, and customers were charged 25 cents a month to check out books. The library became public in 1927. A copy of A History of the United States by Benson Lossing was checked out in 1927 from the St. Helena Public Library. All of us are just wondering where the book could have been for so long from checked out in 1927. Actually, none of us have seen a library book that was checked out in 1892 or anything else, and to have it be from this library from that far back is really incredible," Crichton said. The mystery man who dropped the book off gave little explanation as to where it has been for the past nine and a half decades. The gentleman just said something about his father but didn't catch anything else. He didn't give his name. It wasn't somebody that she recognized. Other staff have no idea who this gentleman is. So, we'd love to find out more about the story. Crichton said. The library estimated the book's past due bill at more than $1,700 but decided to waive the fine. It would have been a lot, but I don't think that we would have charged that much at any point, Crichton said. With the long missing book now back in its rightful place, the library hopes to add its own chapter to the book story. Okay, and that's all I got on that one there. You had the guy who probably didn't want to give him any, any information just dropped off the book because uh, he didn't want to pay that big fine, $1,700. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is a picture of the book. And let me go to my next one. Okay, this one is from uh, KMOV Channel 4 out of St. Louis also. It said, man from Chesterfield accused of crashing U-Haul truck into security barrier at White House. It's also out of a uh, Associated Press. Washington, AP and KMOV, police have arrested a man from Chesterfield who they believe intentionally crashed a U-Haul truck into a security barrier at a park across from the White House. The box truck's driver smashed into the barrier near the north side of Lafayette Square on Monday at around 10 p.m., Secret Service spokesman Anthony Guglielmi said in a statement. No one was injured. Download the KMOV News app, Officers from the Secret Service and the Metropolitan Police Department searched the truck after the crash. Video posted by Wusa TV shows a police officer at the scene picking up and taking an inventory of several pieces of evidence from the truck, including a Nazi flag. Based on a preliminary investigation, investigators believe the driver may have intentionally struck the security barriers at Lafayette Square, Guglielmi said. Authorities offered no additional details about the possible motive and had not released the driver's identity. The U.S. Park Police said the man, later identified as Sai Kandula, 19, was arrested on multiple charges, including threatening to kill, kidnap or inflict harm on a president, vice president or member of their family, assault with a dangerous weapon, reckless driving, destruction of federal property, and trespassing. 
Lafayette Square, which offers perhaps the best view of the White House available to the public, has long been one of the nation's most prominent venues for demonstrations. The park was closed for nearly a year after federal authorities fenced off the area at the height of nationwide protests over policing following the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, but it reopened in May 2021. U-Haul is a moving truck, trailer, and self-storage rental company based in Phoenix. Yeah, and this, uh, this guy here is from Chesterfield. That's Chesterfield, Missouri. That's in St. Louis County, by the way. Yeah, I'm surprised nobody tried to do something like this uh, all this time now because of Biden. Anyway, you know what happened to, um, can't think of his name now. Anyway, oh, John F. Kennedy, you know what happened to him. And Abe Lincoln. Anyway, this is from Newsmax. This one here. Uh, Tucker biography alleges Dominion demanded Carlson firing. A Tucker Carlson biographer is sharing details of his upcoming book, again alleging that Carlson's firing was a condition demanded by Dominion in the $787.5 million settlement with Fox. Carlson's personal Twitter account shared the video of author Chadwick Moore, commenting only with an emoji of eyeballs, suggesting his 7.5 million followers should take a look at the claims. It has now been reported that his firing was a condition demanded by Dominion as part of the settlement with Fox, although Dominion has denied this, my sources have intimate knowledge of the situation, and they have assured me, even before this news leaked, that is, in fact, the truth, Chadwick said in a two-minute video. If that is true, it would mean that a small group of people who have a controlling interest in Dominion have managed to silence what is arguably the most important and influential conservative voice in the country, possibly until after the next presidential election. Knowing Tucker as I do, I am confident that he will not be silenced, as I am sure all of you are as well. Moore's authorized biography, Tucker, is due to be released July 18, but he tweeted the video Monday morning, expressing urgency on his scoop. Variety, one of the nation's leading entertainment news publications, claimed Carlson was told by a Fox Corporation board member his ouster was part of a verbal agreement made with Dominion. The report also said Dominion had leveraged to potentially back out of the deal before it is ultimately finalized in late May, if Carlson was not removed from the network. Dominion has vehemently denied the reports of having demanded Carlson's firing. The reports of our involvement with his firing are 100% false, a Dominion spokesperson told Newsmax after the Variety report was published. As the Fox principals who negotiated the settlement well know, Dominion made no demands about Tucker Carlson's employment orally or in writing. Any claims otherwise are categorically false and a thinly veiled effort to further damage Dominion. Fox, too, reiterated its position that it is categorically false that Carlson lost his job as part of a Dominion settlement. Still, Dominion implied that Fox or its staff may be behind these false claims. Fox should take every effort to stop these lies immediately, the Dominion spokesperson said. But more shed light on the controversy Monday. For the last year, I've been writing the definitive biography of a Tucker Carlson, based on thorough research and 100 plus hours of interviews, more tweeted. But there's some info that can't wait for July 18, the scoop on why Fox cancelled his show. Moore said he was working closely with Tucker when he was taken off the air by Fox, was a regular guest on his show, and happened to be a guest on the final episode, the Friday night, April 21st, before Carlson's abrupt firing the following Monday morning. I've also seen a monologue that Tucker planned to deliver on Monday, April 24th, before his show was abruptly taken off the air, Moore said in the video. That monologue dealt with, among other things, investigations around January 6th and particularly Ray Epps, the only person captured on video inciting people to violence at the Capitol that day and allegedly an FBI informant, who still has not been arrested or charged. Both Epps and the FBI have stated categorically that he was neither an informant of the Bureau nor an employee. Okay, that's all I got on that one there. Yeah, I think uh, Dominion was, oh, did get uh, Tucker Carlson fired. And don't believe what Dominion tells you. They're going to deny it no matter what. Just like the crook said, I didn't steal, I didn't steal that item. Anyway, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is from Daily Mail. FBI again refuses to hand over documents. Republicans say it proves Biden was involved in bribery screen, uh, scheme.
FBI officials met with House Oversight Committee staff Monday after missing a May 10 deadline to provide a document allegedly linking Biden to a cash for access scheme. A committee aide told DailyMail.com that Chairman James Comer is expected to announce next steps soon. Read more. The FBI has again refused to hand over an internal document that Republicans claim shows President Joe Biden was involved in a criminal scheme with a foreign national. The House Oversight Committee, which is leading the investigation into influence peddling by the first family, met with bureau officials on Monday who, who refused to hand over the file. The internal FD-1023 form apparently details an arrangement for an exchange of money for policy decisions, the Republicans said. The Bureau's latest stonewalling came as a second IRS whistleblower came forward, claiming he was sidelined from the Hunter Biden probe when he claimed the president's son was getting preferential treatment. The FBI missed a noon deadline on Wednesday, May 10 to provide the document, angering Republicans who said FBI Director Chris Wray may face consequences. As a result, a committee aide told DailyMail.com that Comer is expected to announce next steps soon. The meeting Monday comes after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said the FBI is poised to hand over the potentially damning document after he spoke with FBI Director. I wanted to be clear with the FBI Director, McCarthy told Fox News Maria Bartiromo Sunday. He confirmed that he held a phone call with Ray, adding, Congress has a right, and we have the jurisdiction, to oversee the FBI. I explained to the director that we will do everything in our power, and, that, we have jurisdiction over the FBI, that we have the right to see this document," McCarthy continued. I believe, after this call, we will get this document. Comer and Senator Chuck Grassley wrote to Ray in a Friday evening letter marking nine days since the deadline passed, calling it, unacceptable. The FBI's credibility is on the line, and their continued failure to cooperate will have long-lasting consequences, Grassley said. Okay, let's see. There's more to read on this if you want to read the rest of it. It's a long article. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to be pushing this one to the FBI. Bi Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, Dominion, they all get busted. Let me go to the next one. This is from the coup down. The U.S. government is facing backlash after auctioning off an Italy-sized portion of the country. Sad to see. In March, the Biden administration authorized a huge area of the Gulf of Mexico to be auctioned to oil companies for oil and gas drilling, The Guardian reports. The parcel is called Lease 259, according to The Guardian. It stretches from the southern tip of Texas to the Alabama-Florida border, covering 73.3 million acres, an area as large as Italy. The first 1.6 million acres were put up for auction in March. 32 oil companies bid a total of $309.7 million for the license to drill in the region at the Department of the Interior's auction, The Guardian reports. It is expected that the companies who win the rights to lease 259 will drill in the area for the next 50 years, producing 1 billion barrels of oil and 4.4 trillion cubic feet of gas, The Guardian says. According to the Biden administration, this auction is required by the terms of the recent Inflation Reduction Act, The Guardian reports. While the bill made strides in shifting the U.S. to more affordable and cleaner sources of energy, it included compromises with the oil industry. However, according to The Guardian, while Biden was required to allow some drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, he was not forced to sign over such a huge area. If this continues, all of the good Biden has done for the future will be undone by Biden himself, Ben Jealous, executive director of the Sierra Club, told The Guardian. The massive drilling projects being planned in the Gulf of Mexico will cause two major problems, The Guardian explains. First, the drilling itself will cause pollution that will impact both the ocean environment and the Gulf Coast. This area was heavily damaged by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010, and more drilling could lead to a repeat of the disaster. Second, the fuel extracted from the region will pollute the air. A recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said governments around the globe are using too many of these polluting fuel sources, The Guardian reports. At the current rate, the world will pass the recommended limit on carbon air pollution before 2030. Governments need to cut back, and the recent auction is a step backward. And um, there's more to read. Oh, no, that's it. That's it. It just said, uh, sad to see. Said one commenter on Reddit. Anyway, so he's going to take away our gas powered cars, and he's going to pollute the, uh, uh, the atmosphere. Leave it to Biden. 
you know, I never heard of anything Biden have done good in this in this country. Not one thing. Anyway, let me go to the next one. This from uh, a Reuters or Reuters, we're going to call it. Uh, Biden and McCarthy's AIDS hunt for bipartisanism, debt ceiling deal. Reuters, White House and congressional Republican negotiators will meet again on Tuesday to resolve a months-long impasse over raising the government's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling, with the nation facing the risk of default in as soon as nine days. President Joe Biden's Democrats and the Republicans who control the House of Representatives, led by Speaker Kevin McCarthy, remain deeply divided about how to rein in the federal deficit. Democrats argue wealthy Americans and businesses should pay more taxes while Republicans want spending cuts. Biden and McCarthy emerged on Monday evening from their third meeting this year on the debt ceiling talking about the need to find bipartisan compromise, even as they cling to policies that expose the divides between the two parties. White House aides headed back to Capitol Hill after the meeting for further talks Monday night. Biden and Democrats want to freeze spending in the 2024 fiscal year at the levels adopted in 2023, arguing that would represent a spending cut because agency budgets won't match inflation. The idea was rejected by Republicans, who are insisting on cuts to 2022 levels, Democratic leaders said on Monday. Republicans are insisting federal spending must be significantly reduced. My computer jumping on me again. Anyway, that's all I'm going to play on that one there. You know, Biden got to stop spending money. He's just throwing money away like it's growing on trees. Biden is not a president. Let me go to the next one. It pisses me off. This from Business Insider. One of Putin's closest friends built him a $3.2 million fishing villa in Finland then had to scrap it when the Russian leader showed up and wasn't keen on fishing in the country, said the report. A $3.2 million fishing villa built for Vladimir Putin sits and used in Finland, the insider reported. The luxury home has three floors, a wine cellar, a sauna, and an elevator, but was never completed. The man stopped building it when he realized Putin wasn't keen on Finnish fishing, per the insider. Full screen. Russian leader Vladimir Putin has a multi-million dollar fishing villa waiting for him in Finland, but he'll probably never use it. The abandoned holiday home is on the coast of Lake Saima in southeast Finland and was built for Putin by a close friend at the cost of around $3.2 million, according to the Russian independent outlet The Insider, which has no affiliation to Insider. The three-story villa boasts an elevator, a wine cellar, an underground garage, a sauna, a personal swimming pool, a billiard room, an office, and eight toilets, the insider reported, citing a master plan of the house. But it was never completed, according to the outlet's reporter, Sergei Konev. Okay, that's all I'm playing on that one there, and um, there's more to read from read. Everything will be in my description box anyway. Let me go on the next one here. This is from The Telegraph. The great immigration lie is about to be exposed. I will never forget being in the members bar in Strasbourg in 2003 and overhearing a conversation between two Europhile conservative MEPs of long standing. They were boasting and laughing to each other about how Eurosceptic they had claimed to be during their latest reselection meetings. They thought that openly lying to hard-working Tory activists was funny. I had been an MEP for three years at this point, and probably still had some belief that our political class was generally well-intentioned, even if it was often misguided and weak. But here, before my eyes, was the proof of how wrong I was. I felt nothing but contempt for these two men. When the immigration figures are announced on Thursday, I believe a good proportion of the British public will feel as scornful of the government as I was resentful of those MEPs 20 years ago. The Home Office is expected to confirm that between 700,000 and 1 million people have been granted the right to live in this country in the past year alone. Since the 1960s, there has been an assumption that the Conservative Party is tougher on immigration than the Labour Party. This explains why, in 2010, David Cameron made it a big election issue. During the previous decade, New Labour, under Tony Blair, had opened the door to mass immigration without properly consulting the public. Cameron pledged to cut it drastically. His party's manifesto promised to take steps to take net migration back to the levels of the 1990s, tens of thousands a year, not hundreds of thousands. This sounded credible, if a little woolly. 
Okay, just more to read about this. Going to read the rest of it. This is about a word in I believe. I should have known it's a telegraph. Anyway, um, let me go on the next one here. Now, I'm going to have a few garden things here. This from uh, D uh, Den Garden. Man sh shares his most important life hack for growing monstrous tomatoes. Since it's mid-May and still spring, it is the perfect time to tend to your gardening duties. Whether planting flowers in a huge planter, growing strawberries using window boxes, or planting veggies such as tomatoes, with a few tricks you can grow some juicy and delicious fruits and veggies and pretty flowers. TikToker at Farming Jintheburbs discovered the best gardening hack for planting tomatoes, according to him, and he claims TikTok is the answer. Are you taking notes? As you might know, growing juicy and big tomatoes in your garden requires proper care and attention throughout the season. To get started, choose tomatoes known for their large size and juicy flavor. Some popular varieties include beefsteak, brandywine, and mortgage lifter, however, make sure to choose the right kind of tomato suitable for your climate and growing conditions. Step 1 is to pinch off all the lower leaves of the tomato vine and just leave the top two, as seen in the video. The next step requires planting it super deep, so the little hairs on the stem turn into roots, as tomatoes thrive in well-draining, nutrient-rich soil. With that said, amend the soil with organic matter like compost or well-rotted manure to improve its fertility before planting. The ideal soil pH is around 6.2 to 6.8. Keep in mind that tomatoes need at least 8 hours of direct sunlight daily for optimum growth and fruit production. Therefore, make sure to choose a sunny spot in your garden for planting tomatoes. Give each tomato plant enough space to grow and spread its branches. Space plants about 2 to 3 feet apart to ensure good air circulation, which reduces the risk of diseases. As you can see, only the top leaves are showing, and the stem with the hairs is under the dirt level. This will skyrocket, apparently, because it will get way more nutrients this way. Last but not least, ensure to water your tomatoes, as they require consistent moisture. However, avoid overwatering, as it can lead to root rot, therefore, aim for about 1 to 2 inches of water per week. It is also recommended to feed your tomato plants with a balanced fertilizer or organic tomato fertilizer to ensure they receive essential nutrients. Now, let's see. There was a thing. Yeah. I'm going to click here to watch the, uh, the video, the TikTok uh, the video. Okay, uh, I can't play that video on this new channel. I just realized it's playing music and I'll get a uh, copyright strike against me. But anyway, what he's saying is... Um anyway, he said, uh, t t take off all these leaves here and then b just leave the f top few leaves and bury it, the whole plant, stem and all, down into the ground, just revealing the leaves at the top. And um, I used to be a temporary landscaper, and they taught me to say, you don't bury the plants above the crown. That's the bottom part of the stem right above the roots. That's the crown. And they told me you don't do that. So I already got my tomato plants uh, planted. So... I might try one plant next year and see if it works. So you have to stay tuned for at least a year. <laughs> anyway. 
I'll, I'll see if it works. Yeah, let me go to my next one here. This one here from the cool down. Expert farmer shares how to avoid an influctuating common gardening mistake. I wonder why mine looked so different. You may think blanching is only something done to vegetables after being harvested, but there's a trick called blanching that will prevent the celery in your garden from becoming thin and bitter. The scoop. Blanching is covering portions of a plant and blocking it from the sun, which prevents photosynthesis and chlorophyll production, which gives plants their green color. The same thing happens to lettuce naturally, which is why the outer leaves are always a darker green than the inner leaves. TikToker Andre the Farmer, at Andretha Farmer, recently posted a video showing how to blanch celery, or binding celery, as he calls it. Okay, I'm stopping it here. I'm going to play this this video here. If, if they're playing music on the sound, I'll have to mute it. Hey guys, I did a video showing the difference between celery that's blanched versus celery that's not blanched. And blanching is a process, I call it binding, but it's really called blanching. People are going to argue about that. But it's basically where you take something like cardboard or newspaper, and you're going to wrap this around your celery and nice and tight. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow your celery to grow really thick stalks. You know how you get celery in the supermarket, it's nice and thick, and you do celery at home and it comes out all spindly? Well, if you bind your celery, then you're gonna get that thick celery just like it is in the store. And all you gotta do is just wrap that around. I'm gonna leave that on there for probably about, um, maybe about two months or so. And that celery is gonna come out a little lighter in color, more translucent, and it's gonna be definitely thicker. So that's what it looks like. That's some bound celery right there. Hope that helps. All right, see you guys, bye. And you can read the rest of this in my description box if you like. Uh, that one there, I can play the sound because there, there's no music. Now, everything I'm showing you, try it at your own risk because uh, I don't know if they work or not. I would have to do it myself to see. I have never grows, uh, grown celery yet. I might try that next year, maybe. Who knows? And let me go to the next one. Okay, this one here is a gardening tip. It's this from uh, Den Garden. Gardener shares advice for stopping roly polies from eating your uh, your garden plants. They have many names: potato bugs, armadillo bugs, doodle bugs, sow bugs, wood bugs, and tomato bugs. But I think we all know them by one of the more common names: roly polies. They are the small little dark gray bugs that look like they have a hard shell, and they curl up into balls when you pick them up. These bugs are super cute, harmless, and often a favorite of kids to look at and hold. Although they pose basically no threat to humans and don't seem to have much threat to gardens, they do often hurt gardens and nibble on the leaves of crops from time to time. If you've checked your garden and noticed some nibbles taken, but can't identify a pest it may be a Raleigh Polly, and one gardener has shared his special tips for making them stop. Click here to watch the video. Raleigh polys are not considered your typical pest, as they are actually incredibly beneficial to the environment, unlike ticks and mosquitoes. Raleigh polys eat decaying plants and vegetation helping with the decomposition of vegetation and insects, aiding in the process of matter breakdown. If there is no decaying vegetation available to Raleigh polys then they will seek out living plants foliage for food, and this is the instance when Raleigh polys eat your plants in the garden. The simplest way to prevent them from not eating your garden plants is by tossing some old leaves, decaying materials or leaves under your garden plants for them to munch on instead. Love what you're reading. Be sure to follow us. Okay, and that's all I got on that one there. Yeah, I wasn't for sure if there was good for your plants or not. Let me play this video here, hopefully no music. So I'll just read the titles to you. So no matter what plant you grow, you'll eventually find yourself needing to do some garden pest control. Fortunately, many bugs can be dealt with using non-toxic methods. A strong spray of water with a hose can knock aphids off plants, discourage moths from laying eggs using floating row covers, protect uh, your seedling from flea beetles, with floating roll covers until the plants begin to flower. Remove uh, mealy bugs from plants 
with uh, strong sprays of water are swabbing with alcohol dip cotton swabs. Various poison snails baits are available, but check labels for products that are harmful and to beneficial insects are not harmful to beneficial insects. And that's all I got on that one there. And um, I have used a uh, beer in in the uh, like a a lid cover or something like that, like a uh, tuna fish cans, and um, the slugs go in there and drown. So that's the best way that I know to get rid of slugs without using any poisons or anything like that. And let me get my next one here. This from Den Garden. It's probably my last. No, I might have one more. Anyway, it says woman has genius chemical free hack for keeping mosquitoes away from outdoor food that smells incredible. Commence the summer BBQs and midday picnics, it's summer. There are a few classic things that can be found at every summer barbecue, a grill, some burger patties, and a dude wearing flips flops holding a beer in a hand with his Hawaiian shirt unbuttoned flipping those burgers. There's one other thing that frequents home BBQs, and that's mosquitoes. Pesky, humming in your ear and leaving painful bites all over your exposed skin. But they don't have to be there and in fact, we found a perfect hack for exiling them from BBQs altogether, check it out. TikToker at Anna Lanier 2 or what she likes to call herself CEO of Randomness is the one who blessed us all with this mosquito ridding hack. So the next time you raise your glass to cheers, raise it a bit higher for Anna, and this great tip. Mosquitoes are afraid of a lot of things, I mean full grown humans swat at them and they just keep coming back. But they hate certain smells, which citrus and cloves just happen to be two of them. With this knowledge the woman cuts her citrus in half, places cloves in the pulp of the citrus, and lays them out next to her food station. Not only does it repel mosquitoes, but it also looks kind of cute. Okay, I don't know if that works or not, but you can try it yourself if you want, at your own risk. And let me go to the next one here. This is from uh, Den Garden. This should be my last garden one. Gardener shares her organic and natural aphid prevention from her garden. It's finally that time of year, spring has well come and gone and gardens are in full force. Taking over raised beds and in-ground rows, are lush green plants just starting to emerge their blooms and working towards flowering. It's quite easy to create a blooming successful garden but trying to prevent pests or treat pests once they arrive is one of the hardest. From slugs, snails, squirrels, and moles it's hard to find a preventive solution, but perhaps one of the harvests to get rid of is aphids. One gardener shared her secret and organic preventive solution that keeps aphids out. Home gardener on TikTok at Mrs.T.N.Me shared her secret solution for keeping aphids out of the garden that is natural and easy to make at home. Using a pump sprayer she fills it with her solution, which is a mix of garlic and cayenne spray which the aphids hate. Aphids are sap-sucking pests. They quickly establish their homes on the leaves of plants and pierce them to suck the sap off, this is often why you will see small spots on the leaves of plants. If you don't take care of an infestation of aphids they can quickly take over an entire garden, destroying it. Okay, you just pump spray, uh, pump sprayer. She fills with a solution of mi mixture of garlic and cayenne and pepper. I heard if you want to keep rodents out of your garden, you use uh, cayenne pepper. Bad thing about that, if you, if you water it or if it rains, you got to reapply it. What I'm going to do this year, I got some uh, seeds from uh, Habrano uh, uh, peppers, and they are so hot. I'm going to break them down in my garden because I get squirrels in my in my uh, barrel garden I got another YouTube channel about my garden and let me go to the next one it's from uh, CBS News Russia's Wagner group accused of of a massacre hidden from the world Garobale, Cameroon 
Russia's Wagner mercenary group has again claimed control of the contested Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, a claim yet again denied by Kiev, which says its forces are still fighting southwest of the industrial town and advancing around its flanks. The dense fog of war makes it difficult to determine whether one of the longest and bloodiest battles of the Ukraine war has really come to an end. The leader of the private Wagner group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, a longtime associate of Russian President Vladimir Putin, said his forces were taking a break, resting for a few days now that their mission in Bakhmut is complete, and he's handing control of the city over to regular Russian troops. The mercenaries leave behind a blood-stained trail. Alongside Russia's military forces, they've been accused of thousands of war crimes since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine was launched in February 2022. But long before the Wagner Group rose to global infamy in Ukraine, the mercenaries were active in parts of Africa, and they stand accused of committing similar atrocities there. Our CBS News investigation previously revealed how Wagner, designated a transnational criminal organization by the U.S. government, plunders mineral-rich nations including the Central African Republic CR, to fund its criminal and paramilitary activities, such as its role in the Ukraine war. To maintain control over lucrative gold mines and timber forests, the Wagner Group virtually runs the Central African Republic through fear and violence. Editors note, this report includes details of sexual assault and other violence that some people may find distressing. Bucha, Ukraine, April 2022 In the opening months of the Ukraine war, as Russian forces were forced to make a hasty retreat from the suburbs around the capital city Kiev, the killing grounds of Bucha were revealed. On almost every street corner, CBS News found evidence of the horrors that took place. Our cameras captured images of civilians' bodies with their hands bound, strewn along once peaceful country roads. Residents told us harrowing stories of torture, rape and summary executions. Ukrainian and international investigators quickly swooped into Bucha to document the evidence of potential war crimes committed by Russian forces, including mercenaries from the notoriously brutal Wagner Group. Wagner's Grip on the Central African Republic just one year earlier, there was another massacre, but this one was thousands of miles from Ukraine in the Central African Republic town of Bambari. There were no shocking images and no global spotlight, however, as the media are not welcome in Siar. No international prosecutors arrived to document the mass murder of civilians, and no one stepped forward to implicate Wagner mercenaries. Faustin Archange Tudera has been the president of Siar since 2016. He's protected by Wagner gunmen and, in exchange, the Russian company gets contracts to mine gold in the country. The story Wagner spins is that the mercenaries are there to train CR soldiers and help them crush rebel groups that want to overthrow the president. The reality is that the Wagner group has captured the country so completely, that it can act with impunity, and it stands accused of using horrific violence to ensure there's no competition for its revenue stream from local gold merchants. And there's more to read on that, I want to read about that. Bambari Massacre. I'm going to go to my next one now. Everyone from Fox News. FBI expect Congress to be sheep. Ignore allegations of abuse while Bureau plans $4 billion new HQ, said the top Republican. Representative Andy Biggs, Republican Arizona, said Monday that Congress will not continue to go along as sheep as the FBI gets to spy on and abuse the American people following a series of damning revelations and whistleblower allegations against the Bureau. Three FBI whistleblowers testified before the House Subcommittee on Federal Government Weaponization last Thursday alleging that the FBI's Washington, D.C. office pressured the rest of the organization toward a political agenda. Former FBI Special Agents Garrett O'Boyle and Steve Friend spoke of politicization and weaponization at the Bureau, joining more than two dozen other FBI whistleblowers who also raised alarm about the FBI's political motivations. Biggs, who serves as chairman of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Federal Government Surveillance, said on the Faulkner Focus Monday that the Bureau treats Congress like sheep and expects lawmakers to look the other way as they spy on American citizens and launch frivolous investigations, like the Trump-Russia collusion probe, in order to influence the outcome of a presidential election. So, you've got whistleblowers who the Democrats in Congress are saying are not whistleblowers, even though they have done everything they are required to do to be a whistleblower, you've got the FBI saying no problem, Biggs told Fox News host Harris Faulkner. Not only did they come under intense scrutiny under Durham's report, don't forget they also blew up FISA over 200,000 times that they had mistakes and errors in FISA compliance. Okay, now I'm going to go to my next one. 
This one here is uh, from the cool down. Kraft announces major change to iconic product packaging. 900,000 pounds of plastic waste annually. In a step to reduce plastic waste, the Kraft Heinz company is shaking up its packaging with the removal of the iconic shake and bake shaker bag. The packaging change, which will affect all 11 shake and bake products, will help eliminate 900,000 pounds of plastic waste annually, according to the company. But what's shake and bake without the shake? Worry not. Customers can still shake their way to a delicious dinner, with the company encouraging the use of reusable containers as the vessel for adding that extra layer of crunch to your favorite recipes. The shaker bag is an iconic part of the brand, but the company insists that the change will not affect the taste or effectiveness of shake and bake. While the shaker bag is an important part of our legacy, our product is just as effective and delicious without the plastic waste, and we are excited for all the good to come from this simple, yet effective packaging change, Brianna Galvin, brand manager of Shake and Bake, said in a statement. The packaging update is a big step in Kraft Heinz's overall sustainability efforts. The company is working toward 100% of their packaging being recyclable, reusable, or compostable by 2025. Okay, and you're gonna read the rest of this in my description box if you like. What they're doing, those plastic bags that come in, those shake and shake, uh, uh, shake and bake uh, boxes, they're getting rid of the bags. They said you can use um, your own um, reusable container, but you know, what I say, I'll just use a baggie. It's just as good. Use a Ziploc uh, baggie to do mine, but I haven't ate that. Steak, uh, that product for a long time shake and bake and that's all i got for you i hope i get some news for you and uh that you can use and don't forget to like subscribe at least come back once in a while and until next time thanks for watching